Hey there, good morning. My name is Debbie Z. Latuga, and I'm here today to talk to you about the one thing. And I couldn't be so more excited. Thank you so much, everyone who invited me to come today. We're actually going to talk about something really exciting, and that is lies. Right? We're going to talk about lies. We're going to talk about the six lies of productivity. Right? There's a lot of myths out there about how to be more successful, and we want to make sure that you have an understanding that, that some of the things that we might believe might not actually be true. Let me ask you a question. Are there lies in the media? Right? No judgment. Um, is there lies in history? Are there some things that we believe about the way history was told that might not actually be the truth? We are at the point in our lives where we have 24-hour access to news. We have self-professed gurus that say, this is how you do things and this is the way to be successful. Anybody can go on Twitter and be a genius, right? And have their opinion. And yet some of these things that we take as truths might not be truth. Who's ever heard of the Explorer Cortez? Right, so Cortez came to the Americas with the idea of kind of conquering, right? And the story goes that when he got ashore, he told his soldiers to go back and burn the boats. Burn the boats? He was hoping to motivate his, his soldiers and letting them know that, look, you have to commit because we have no exit plan. Well, guess what? It's a lie. It's not true. Um, who's ever heard of the frog in the, the pot story, right? Where if you put a frog in boiling water, he'll jump out. And yet if you put a, pot, a frog in a pot where the water's room temperature and you turn it up slowly, the frog will never know and, 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 and boil to death. Not true. Well, guess what? There are success lies as well. There are things that we have come to believe are true that don't actually help us be successful. Um, how many of you ever said, I wish I was more disciplined? Or maybe if I got two things done at the same time, I could get more accomplished. And how about one of the worst ones ever, which is maybe I just shouldn't dream so big. Maybe I should have smaller goals. So today we're going to talk about the six lies of productivity, the six lies of success, and how we, if we think differently about them, we might be able to create more success. So who's excited about that? Yeah. So let's talk about the first one. Everything matters equally. Everything matters equally. So let me ask you a question. Um, how many of you are a fan of making lists, right? You wake up in the morning, or maybe it's even the night before, you write down everything that you have to get done, right? That's a great productivity strategy, or so we think. How about emails? Because I would argue emails are very similar to lists, meaning we come in Monday morning, we have 20 emails in our inbox. How do we determine how we answer them? For some of us, we answer them in the order we were received. And yet the challenge is, is that would say that everything that's on our to-do list matters equally, right? So the Australian Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, um, actually said that not everything matters equally and the most important thing doesn't always scream the loudest. Achievers operate differently. I'm not saying achievers don't make to-do lists and yet they prioritize. Have you ever had a day where you did a lot of things and you got to the end of the day and you went, wow, I didn't get anything done? Maybe we didn't focus on our, track in, on our priorities. Because priority matters. There are things on our to-do list and in our email that are more important things. And our to-do list can lead us astray. A to-do list is a survival list, not a success list. To-do lists are long. Success lists are short. Who can tell me what the 80-20 principle is or the Pareto principle? Who can tell me? Yes, 20% of our activities lead to 80% of our results. Let me say that again. 20% of our activities lead to 80% of our results. So how does that affect our to-do list or our email list, right? If our 
If we don't know what our priorities are, we can get lost in the details. L let me give you an example. Um, how would you lose weight? If I said, okay, let's mastermind how to lose weight, what would you say? So yeah, eat less, right? What we eat matters. What else? Work out, right? Now let me ask you, is that, are we doing cardio or are we lifting weights? What else? Well, keto will work, right? What else? Weight Watchers. What else works? Um, maybe yoga, maybe drinking a lot of water, maybe getting enough sleep, right? There's a lot of different ways that we can tackle um, losing weight. So now if I said, let's take that, that to-do list of losing weight and let's, let's lower it, let's, let's change it, and let's pick a success list. If we only had to pick four or five things from that list that would really be um, indicators of success, what would some of those things be? Yes, absolutely working out. Yet yeah, maybe it's cardio or weight. What else? What we eat, right? So what we eat matters. What else? Oh, accountability partner, right? If we had someone, a partner, we might be able to be more successful. Let's say we came up with the five top things. And then I said to you, 80-20 rule, right? We have five, that's our success list. How do we narrow that down to the 20%? Well, that would be one. So if I asked you, what was the one thing you could do to lose weight? What would that be? Well, yes, so some of you said diet, right? What you eat, and some of you said exercise. Now, here's the thing. There isn't just one one thing. What might work for you and be your one thing might not work for me and be my one thing. So maybe you've already exercised before and lost a lot of weight. You really like the way it made your body look. So that's going to be your one thing. So every day you're going to wake up and that's what you're going to focus on, working out. And yet my one thing might be what I eat. So I'm going to make that my one thing. I'm going to focus on my diet plan. We have, there's actually a name for that. We call that extreme Pareto. And that's where we take our to-do list and we say, let's make a success list. We make a success list. Um, and that's our 20%. And yet, what's the 20% of our 20%? And we call that Extreme Pareto. And that's the name of the book, which is The One Thing, right? What's the one thing you can do, such by doing it, everything else is easier and necessary. So if the most important thing is the most important thing, why do we ever think that we can do two things at one time? So let's talk about the second law, uh, or, or the second lie of productivity, and that is multitasker, multi, multitasking. Multitasking is a lie. Now, I'm not saying I don't do it. I'm just saying there's been a lot of studies. 2009, Clifford Nass, Stanford University professor, um, did a study with 267 students, and he divided them into two groups, those that were good at multitasking and those that weren't so good at it. And he gave them a series of questionnaires, and what he believed was gonna happen is that the multitaskers were gonna nail it in every category. And actually, he found out this exact opposite. Not only did they not email it in every category, they actually did poorly in every category. So what he determined was, Multitasking is a lie. Multitaskers do lots of things poorly. And here's one thing he discovered about it, and that's the idea of task switching. So if I'm going to do two things at once, I'm gonna to have to switch tasks. And there's actually two parts to that. First, I'm gonna to have to decide to switch tasks. And second, I'm gonna to have to implement the rules of the new task. Well, there's definitely simple tasks and complex tasks. So if I'm watching TV and folding clothes, those are both simple tasks. So if I realize I've stopped folding clothes, I decide to focus on that and I start folding again. And it's a fairly easy decision to make that switch. And yet let's talk about something that's more complex. Let's say that you're working on an Excel spreadsheet and your uh, colleague comes in and says, hey, let's work on the Johnson contract. You have to, one, decide to switch, and two, you have to implement a set of rules to discuss the Johnson project. And those rules might even occupy a different part of your brain. So that's fine, you make the switch and you do that. Now, you decide you're gonna switch back. 
number one, you have to decide to switch back. Hopefully you can remember that you were working on a spreadsheet and you go back to back and you don't get sidetracked to something else. And yet we're going back to the spreadsheet. The second thing is you have to, imp you have to implement the set of rules for doing spreadsheets, which may involve a different part of your brain. So researchers have discovered that up to about 28% of, of, of our work life might be lost to task switching. So, so let's talk about some one thing principles, right? We can't do two things at once. And we can't focus on everything, right? The two tasks that we already talked about was everything matters equally and that multitasking is a lie. So let's move on to the third myth about productivity. And that is, I just wish I had more discipline. How many of you have said that? I've certainly said that. I wish I had more discipline. If I had more discipline, I could be successful. So I work really hard to apply discipline and it doesn't seem to work. So when we talk about discipline, we're also often talking about habit because those two things, although they mean different things, those two concepts intersect. Discipline and habit. Has anybody ever started working out and been successful at working out? And in the beginning, you had to really push yourself to work out. You had to apply discipline to working out. And then all of a sudden, one day you look up and you're working out regularly. And now you miss a day and you feel icky, right? So you switch from, ooh, I gotta make myself go to the gym. And you, you move towards, oh my gosh, I didn't go to the gym, I feel horrible. What happened was, is you applied enough discipline for that to become a habit. So it's a myth that you need to be a disciplined person. You need to have enough discipline to create a habit. You don't have to do everything. You have to be able to focus on the right thing. So how long does it take to create a habit? There's another myth out there. Now, not those of you that have read the book. And yet, how long do, do the gurus say it takes to, to create a habit. Yes, 21 days. Except for 2009, some researchers at the University College of London um, did research and discovered that it actually takes about 66 days. 66 days is the sweet spot. Now, simple habit, a little bit less. 66 days is the average. Complex habit, maybe more. And yet 66 days is a more accurate a description of how long it takes to create a habit. Um, so, so how do we how do we think about the fact that discipline, um, having discipline, is the way to success? First of all, you don't have to have discipline. You have to have discipline long enough to create a habit. Second of all, you really want to focus on one habit at a time, right? Otherwise, you're split, spreading your discipline too thin. Um, number three. Um, you want to do the discipline long enough to acquire the habit. And number four, you might want to get an accountability partner, somebody that you can check in with regularly that will help you stay accountable. So let's talk about the fourth myth or the fourth lie of productivity. And that is willpower is on will call. So what do I mean? It, willpower is on demand. I'm just going to use willpower. I'm going to start this diet and I'm going to use willpower. Um, and yet some days I decide to use willpower to stick to my diet and it's a piece of cake. And, and other days I eat the cake, right? So that willpower doesn't seem to be infinitely available to, to me. And that's because willpower is like a battery. Um, every day when we wake up, our battery is full. Our willpower is full. And every decision that we ever make throughout the day actually uses up part of our battery. And it doesn't matter if it's a small decision, and it doesn't matter if it's a big one. Um, what am I going to eat for breakfast? What am I going to wear today? Do I have to pick up my friend on the way to work? Um, am I going to am I going to answer my email first, or am I going to make some calls? Every single decision we make taxes our willpower and, and it diminishes our willpower battery. So a Stanford University professor, Baba Shiv, did a study with 165 students and he divided them in two groups. 
and each was, had a different task. Group the A was going to memorize a two-digit number, and group B was going to memorize a seven-digit number, right? Not super challenging, two-digit, two a little bit easier. Hey, by the way, for those of you that were born uh, before the 1990s, when I was growing up as a kid, we memorized telephone numbers, seven-digit numbers. We may have had about a hundred of them memorized, and it wasn't a big challenge. So he put them both in the room. They were to memorize the number. Once they memorized the number, they were going to actually go to the next room, and they were going to deliver their memorized number to the researchers. Now, along the way, what they didn't know was that the researchers were going to stop them and thank them for participating in the research project, and they were going to offer them as a thank you, a bowl of fruit, or a piece of cake. And the real study was in that question, right? What do you think happened? Yeah, so now that we know the willpower is a battery, those that memorized the seven digit number chose the cake twice as often. Twice as often they chose the cake, which shows that our willpower is, is diminished by decisions or by tasks. So a slightly more difficult task is going to diminish the willpower your willpower even more. Now let me share with you a second study, and this is fascinating, and this has to do with the Israeli parole system. Shocking, they studied eight judges, and these judges had a really jam-packed um, schedule. And every day they saw between 14 and 35 cases, and they had to make a decision about whether or not to parole that, that uh, inmate. And they only had between six and seven minutes on each one to make the decision. So I guess you're probably not going to be surprised. So the, the best chance to get paroled was about 65%. And there were several times during the day where you had a 65% chance to get paroled. What a surprise. The first part of the day when the judges first got on the bench. Now they had a late morning snack and break. What a surprise, your chance to being paroled rose after the snack. And then what a surprise after a late lunch, your chance to get paroled rose again. And yet after the initial decisions, the chance to get paroled went like this, it tanked. So I could have just imagined if it were me and it was coming up to that lunchtime, I would say, no, excuse me, I'm gonna go to the restroom. You go ahead, I'm gonna wait. I'll be the first one after lunch because I wanna increase my chances to get parole. So what's the takeaway? When would you do your one thing? Right, first thing in the morning, right after a, a mid-morning snack or right after lunch. So let's review the, the the things that we've talked about so far. So we talked about number one, everything matters. Equally, not true. Number two, um, multitasking is a lot. Number three, if I only had more discipline. And number four, your willpower is on will call. So let's talk about the fifth lie. And this one is, is, is really a challenge because I'm certain everyone in this room has said this. Oh, I need more balance in my life. It's the pinnacle. It's the holy grail. It's what we talk about all the time. We need more balance. You know, thousands of years ago, our work was our life. We, 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 we farmed, we planted, we hunted, we, we tended livestock. And if we didn't do that, we didn't live. So our work was our life. And yet many of us are talking about work-life balance and yet we haven't figured out how to implement it now. And here's what it looks like. I actually had someone that worked for me several years ago. Her name was Jean. She told me the story that her and her husband, um, they were in the corporate rat race, right? They worked for different companies. They were flying around the country and they had done that for about 15 years. And, and, and one day they actually met in an airport and neither one of them knew that the other was going to be flying through the airport. And they took a look at their lives and said, we're like ships passing in the night. This isn't, this isn't working for us. We need more balance. So they, so they made a plan and they got out of corporate life and they bought a business 
And right after they bought that business, her husband got sick. He got cancer. And for the next six to seven years, instead of spending that time with each other and building this business, they spent their time going to hospitals and going to doctor's appointments. And unfortunately, after about seven years, he actually passed away. So their attempt to create balance when they retired didn't work. So, so creating balance that way in retirement isn't the path. I want to actually talk about the word counterbalance, right? Because I think we're maybe looking at balance the wrong way. Has anybody ever seen a ballerina on point, right? She's up in the air, she's on her tippy toes, and she's graceful and floating. And she looks so balanced. And yet if you zoomed in and you looked at her feet, they're actually going like this. She is actually counterbalancing moment by moment. And yet when you look at her, she looks like she's floating. So a counterbalanced life can actually look and feel like a balanced life. So, so we have two things in our life that we, that we look at balancing. And we look at our work life and we look at our personal life. Now, our personal life is like a glass ball. If we don't take care of it, that ball drops and it breaks. So when we're looking to create balance in our perfect in our personal life, we want to think shorter, right? Our personal life can't afford to get out of balance for very long. So we're going to want to make course correct very quickly like the ballerina. And yet our work life is like a rubber ball. And if we drop that, it bounces. We may have a big project that we're focusing on and it might take us six months of staying late and working, you know, working on the weekends because we're working on this big project so that we may be out of balance for long periods of time at work. And yet the work ball is a rubber ball and that bounces. Now certainly, once that project is over, not only do we want to counterbalance work in our personal life, we also want to counterbalance in each bucket. If you think of each of those as a bucket, we want to counterbalance our work life. If we spend a, long, a lot of time focusing on a big project, when that project's over, we want to counterbalance it. If we have some stress in our personal life, we want to refocus, reconnect, and then we can, we can, we can shift, right? So the two takeaways is that counterbalance is like two buckets with our work in one and our personal in another. And yet inside of each of those buckets, inside our work life, inside our personal life, we have to counterbalance them as well. Uh, an extraordinary life is counterbalanced, right? It's a counterbalancing act. So let's talk about the last one. And, and this is a big one as well, a big one. And the myth is that big is bad, right? Big is bad. Let me ask you an opportunity. Is a big opportunity good or bad? Well, hopefully good. Um, is a small problem good or bad? Well, a small problem is better than a big problem. What about if someone's, you were, it was the holidays and you had the choice of two presents? Are you going to ask for the big present? And you can pick one of the two, a big present or a small present. Which one do you want? Well, it depends, right? So sometimes a big laugh and a big cry is that exactly what you need. And then sometimes a little chuckle and a couple of tears is all you need. So is big always bad? Here's the thing though, if you put the word big and the word success in the same sentence, people start thinking hard. Or the word big and achievement, some people start thinking complex. However, believing in big is, is, allows you to think differently. Um, entertaining big dreams allows you to think differently and it opens doors. So a young man, Sabir Badia, came to the US with $250 in his pocket and yet he had a big dream. He was gonna build a big successful company and was gonna make millions and millions of dollars. He was focused. 
And he actually built Hotmail and sold it to Microsoft for $400 million. There's actually a word that's related to the, the irrational fear that big is bad, and that is megaphobia. It's an irrational fear that big is bad. Thinking big helps you live an extraordinary life. So here's a couple people from history. Arthur Guinness, right? Guinness beer, if I'm saying that right. Arthur Guinness signed a 9,000 year lease when he opened his company. J.K. Rowling imagined seven years at Hogwarts before she took a pen to paper. Candace Leiter is the mother that started the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. Her, her daughter was killed, she started this organization, and that organization is credited with saving over 300,000 lives. Sam Walton started Walmart. Before he started the company, he created an estate plan that would save his, his family taxes when they made a lot of money. And by the way, it's estimated that that plan saved his family between 11 and $13 billion. And Ryan Herlach was a six-year-old when his teachers told him about people in Africa that struggled to get clean water. And he was inspired. He started a company called um, Ryan's Wells. And it's estimated that 750,000 people have clean water, and it's in over 16 countries. So do big goals, do they seem unattainable? They might at first. You might have to grow into that person to become that, to become that person. You might have to grow to be a person that can achieve that goal. Big stands for greatness, right? Why limit yourself? Why predetermine that it's not in your DNA that achieve, achieving big things is possible for you? Don't fear big. Fear mediocrity. Courage isn't the absence of fear. It's moving past it. Thinking big isn't the absence of doubts. It's moving past it. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Think big, aim high, act bold, and see just how big you can blow up your life. So let's review the six lies that we talked about. The first one was that everything matters equally, right? People that focus on priority and move with purpose on their one thing achieve big results. Number two, multitasking allows you to get more things done, right? Not true. Focusing on one thing will cause you to be more successful. Um, that you have to be a disciplined person to be successful. Not true, right? You have to have discipline long enough to create a habit, and then the habit takes over. Number four, willpower is on will call. Um, we have a natural rhythms of energy every day, and we don't always start with high energy and then keep it throughout the day. There's peaks and valleys, and both rest and food helps recharge our batteries. Um, that you can have a balanced life. Now, you can have a counterbalanced life, recognizing that when you're out of balance and then focusing on the things that you can do to get back into balance. And that big is bad. Big allows you to accomplish big goals. So, so don't play small. Don't, don't doubt your ability. Um, choose big goals. Apply the principles of the one thing and see how big you can blow up your life. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Debbie Z. Latuga, and I'd love to help you implement the one thing.